If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm joined in studio by our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here as usual. Thank you. Steve has done a lot of extensive research on the early church fathers of the Christian church, that is. And uh, we're going to be examining and have been examining because after all, this is show number six in a continuing series we've been doing on early Christian church history. Uh, This is a vital subject, you might say, in my opinion, due to the fact that there are so many attacks today against the Bible, against the Word of God, against the Christian faith, or those who would actually take the Christian faith seriously. (laughs) Heaven forbid that you would take the Christian faith seriously, but true Christians actually do that. And We like to think that we're true Christians and we take the Word of God seriously and that includes all that it encompasses about it, uh, which would include church history, uh, which tells us a lot about the validity of the doctrines and uh, creeds that uh, our faith holds and and has held over the last two millennia. Now, with all that said, I will say that we have done five shows in the past. Uh, It's too much to recap here, so if you missed that, go back and check it out or go to our website. Uh, uh, We may already have those shows on the internet. Contact us or wherever, and you should be able to get your hands on that material. Now, for the purpose of this show, show number six in this early church history show, I'm going to have my main researcher here, Steve, pick up where we left off last time and uh, take you right on down this road we've been traveling on what the early church Christian fathers can tell us about what we in the 21st century believe today. Go ahead, brother. All right. Well, in the last show, we focused on Jesus, but we only focused on the the timeless nature of Jesus, you know, in heaven before he came to earth. This show, we're going to focus about Jesus' incarnation on earth. And uh, recapping from other shows, uh, we're going to say, if we didn't have any Bibles to look at, what will we know about Christianity solely based on what four or more church writers affirmed prior to 325 A.D. and none denied? And as we're seeing, um, we can learn a whole lot. And looking on uh, Jesus coming to earth, we have 20 writers that all affirm the virgin birth of Christ. Where it says from Isaiah 7.14 in the Old Testament is prophesied in Matthew 1.18.23 and Luke 1.34.35 in the New Testament. Now, if someone today denies the virgin birth of Christ, um, then they are um, pretty much outside the pale uh, of what any early Christians believed. I mean, even many of the Gnostics and even some of the Elkisite uh, Ebionites, even, even the, these early church cults and heresies, they even believed in, in the virgin birth of Christ. And so when you have people like uh, Spong and, and uh, some Episcopalians who are trying to deny that, then you say, well, you know, why are you calling yourselves Christians if there's so much of, of what they taught that you're denying? Okay. The next thing is that Jesus was a real sinless man. Okay, he was sinless, and also he didn't just appear to be human, he actually really was human. So Jesus was not half God and half man. Jesus was 100% God, and Jesus was also 100% man. And we have 20 writers that affirm that. And that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was a good guy, you know, from both the Bible and the early church father. That's that's eight writers. Uh, The cross is shaped. Uh, Some Jehovah's Witnesses try to say that the cross was just like a a vertical torture stake. But we have eight writers that show that that it looks like a cross like you see in a church with outstretched arms. 
Um, Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. Uh, we have over 31 writers that affirm that. Many Muslims uh, from the Quran, they would agree that Jesus appeared to die on the cross, but they would deny that he actually did. And if that's true, then how did all these Christians get uh, misled? Did they get misled by God or somebody else? All right. Also, uh, there is darkness and earthquake at Jesus' death. Uh, some years ago, someone wrote me saying that there wasn't any evidence for that uh, besides the Gospels. Well, there's a lot of, of evidence of early church writings, which they got not just from reading the Bible, but they'd also get from uh, you know, talking to the apostles, and they had disciples, and they had disciples and talked to them. And we have 13 Christian writers uh, that affirm the miraculous events uh, at the, uh, the time Jesus has died, as well as some non-Christian writers, too. Um, Thallus, for example, a Palestinian historian. Uh, also, that Jesus rose from the dead. We don't have one or two people saying Jesus rose from the dead. We have over 30 writers uh, in, showing that Jesus rose from the dead. And then Jesus ascended to heaven, or Jesus will return. We have 17 writers saying that. And the incarnation of the word, or, or Jesus, we have, we have 20 writers um, saying about incarnation, I mean God in, God in the flesh. Uh, some examples of J4, you know, the cross is shaped, and the letter of Barnabas, which we're not too sure when it was written. It may have been written as early as 100 A.D., or it may have been written as late as 150 A.D., but either way, it was um, pretty early. And you're not talking about the Gospel of Barnabas right. that the Muslims are always referencing to to support their Islamic faith. Right, that was a medieval forgery. The, the, this is an early uh, church book that's totally different content. The only thing is the same as the name, and we don't know that this Barnabas was one of Acts or a different Barnabas. Okay, so that's just to clarify to our, our viewers out there that this is not the, the literature that the Muslims are always referencing to. Right, right. And Barnabas says that Moses made the figure of the cross when he stretched out his arms. Now, if you recall, when the Amalekites were attacking the Israelites, uh, M Moses stood on a mountain, and when he had his arms outstretched, uh, the, uh, the, then they're winning, and then, of course, they were getting tired, and so, they, and so they, they, were, they were held up, and so his arms were held out, which shows it was by the cross, is what the letter of Barnabas was pointing out. Uh, for J8, that Jesus rose from the dead, Clement of Rome who wrote a letter to the Corinthians about 97 or 98 A.D., said, Let us consider, beloved, how the Lord continually proves to us that there shall be a future resurrection, of which he has rendered the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruits by raising him from the dead. Okay, this, is, this may have been written before uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation of the Bible was written. We're not completely sure when the book of Revelation was written, but uh, even back then, independent of the Bible, you have the early Christians affirming um, the, the resurrection of Christ. Okay, well, some religions back then, though, disagreed with some of these points. The Gnostics, in general, deny that Jesus was truly human, but he only appeared to be human. Some Ebionites, uh, some accepted the virgin birth of Christ, and some denied the virgin birth of Christ. Uh, Elkisite Ebionites, who came a little bit later, uh, they were like a twist on the Ebionites that said Jesus was born on the earth many times, and sometimes he's born on the virgin, and sometimes not. So they're kind of way out there, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're kind of having it both ways there. All right, and the religions today uh, that would disagree with these points. Uh, many liberal Christians often do not believe in the birth in the virgin birth of Christ, though some liberals do. Uh, an Episcopalian writer, uh, Spong, I mentioned, is especially famous for denying this. And some liberal Christians do not believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. When I was growing up in a liberal church, at one point the pastor told me that he did believe that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. And uh, now some months later he told me, well, maybe he believes he rose from the dead after all. But the way he said it, it was like it wasn't too important to him either way. <laughs> okay, well, when you're denying these things, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, about 1 through 6, that, it, that if you deny these things, that, then your faith is in vain. Mm -hmm. um, so don't call yourself a Christian if you don't want to, you know, you know, believe and in, in, in follow it, what well, was taught. Well, I've always said the importance of the Bible, the Word of God, as it's given to us down through church history and even to this day, if God did not think it was important to follow the teachings as he's established by his prophets, by his son, Jesus Christ, and the apostles after him, if he didn't think this was important to believe these things, like the Ten Commandments, for instance, mm -hmm. from Moses, then why bother to write it down? Why bother to send prophets? Why bother to have apostles or prophets or any of these guys? Why bother if you can just believe anything you want? And this is the 
importance of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and as we've already established in previous shows in this early church uh, history series we're doing, that doctrine, the doctrines of God coming through his prophets, his apostles, his own son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, John 1.1 1, 1, and verse 14, shows the importance of all this. And when you bring up these, these other heretics, the Ebionites and so forth, and you're talking about this to our viewers, the Gnostics and so forth, basically what you're showing is, now here's a bunch of people, just like in our day and age in the 21st century, that simply don't believe what God has set forth through his prophets, his apostles, and his son. They simply don't believe it. And if you're not going to believe what God has sent as important, then, of course, it, by necessity, makes you a non-Christian, mm -hmm. which is basically what Steve was just saying, and I couldn't help but throw a little bit more in with that. But anyway, go ahead, brother. Okay. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, while they affirm some of the stuff that we said about Christ, uh, they teach that Jesus did. They have taught that Jesus did not rise physically, but he only rose spiritually. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they said Jesus died in a vertical torture stake. Uh, Reverend Moon, the Unification Church, they have a similarity to the Jehovah's Witnesses on one point, and that they said that he only rose spiritually. They have a little different twist. Uh, they said that Jesus couldn't rise physically because. Uh, they claim John the Baptist failed God, and so uh, Satan invaded Jesus' body through no, through no fault of Jesus, and so that's why I say he didn't do that. So they like turn everything around, and yet they claim to be Christian, but it's like if someone will go back and read uh, the Bible in one hand, or what the early Christians really said in the other hand, it's like, you know, people who believe these things aren't a part well, of, of what they proves, thought. It proves that Reverend Moon, who says he's the second coming of Christ, is right. a false prophet. Right. He's not telling the truth, and he's coming up with a different gospel, which the Apostle Paul condemned, as I mentioned before in other shows, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Okay. So, anyway, go ahead. Uh, all right, so in a, in a public forum, uh, oh, I had a, a discussion with a Sunni imam in which I brought up each of these points and then gave him an opportunity. Uh, it wasn't really a debate. It was, I'd bring up the point, he would agree or disagree, say his point, and then we move on to the other one. Uh, but on the virgin birth of Christ, uh, he agreed, uh, the Quran agrees, um, you know, Muslims in general will, will, will all agree with that. You know, it's kind of funny, some Episcopalians won't agree, but the Muslims will agree <laughs> on, 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 on this one. J2, uh, Jesus Christ was a real sinless man. Um, the they, Gnostics denied this, uh, but the Muslims uh, completely agree on this one. Uh, Muslims also believe all other prophets were, were sinless too. Uh, which is a little different, but, but we agree that Jesus was sinless. All right? uh, Jesus was crucified or died on the cross. Uh, he disagreed. Uh, we, talked, we, we talked about that. Uh, the Quran did, does say that, that in appearance he did, but that God uh, changed and substituted somebody else. Okay? Uh, darkness and earthquake when Jesus died. Uh, the Muslim imam didn't have anything in the Muslim hadiths or Quran to say either way. He said probably not. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead. Well, if he didn't rise from the for, uh, die on the cross, he wouldn't have risen from the dead, so he disagreed. Jesus ascended to heaven and will return. Okay, and he, he agreed that Jesus ascended to heaven, but it says in Muslim tradition it doesn't say how. Okay, so Islam also teaches that, that Jesus will come back again, which is kind of an interesting parallel. Mm -hmm. okay. You get that in some of their hadiths right. and so forth, talking about how he's going to lead an army in battle, and then later get married, and mm -hmm. then later get buried, and I mean, I, you know, that's a whole other subject, but anyway, right. it's, a, it's also a different gospel, by the way. But anyway, go ahead. All right, so, uh, so, so moving on, looking at what they said about, we said how Jesus was in heaven, how he came to earth, but exactly why did Jesus come to earth? That's kind of probably one of the most critical parts in, in Christianity. Well, they had a lot to say about that. First, to kind of warm things up, Jesus was sent by the Father, John 17, 18. There were seven writers that affirmed that. Jesus emptied himself when he came to earth. So when he came to earth, he was still God, but he emptied himself of uh, much of his glory. And he prayed, you know, in this high priestly prayer in, in, in John that restored to me the glory I had before the world began. And also I notice you've got the, the reference here to Philippians 2, 7 and so mm -hmm. forth, that being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Right. So even though he's God in the flesh, he didn't exercise all his divine attributes right. while he was a man on the earth. Right. So anyway, go ahead. All right, now Jesus endured temptation. Okay, it's not that Jesus, because Jesus was God, when Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus kind of floated through life. 
uh, uh, no temptation, when he suffered, when he hungered. It wasn't like, the, oh, oh, I'm God, so I just don't, won't worry about it. When temptation. Jesus was truly and genuinely tempted, and yet as God, he, um, he, he never fell. Uh, Jesus truly suffered. This gets back to the fact that he, he was a, a real human being, but nine writers talked about how Jesus you know, definitely was tempted. Okay, so when you get that in Luke 4, Matthew 4, and the references you have here. Right. It's a, right out of the and other way. references too, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Jesus suffered for us. Okay, if Jesus was some phantom, then the suffering would just be all fake, kind of like a, a, a misleading magic show or something. But no, the 25 early church writers mentioned that Jesus really suffered for us, as, 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 as do the Gospels and Hebrews and 1 Peter. Okay? Uh, Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the commands for the Old Testament law. Not so many writers on this one because it's more of a subtle doctrine, but it's uh, five writers for that. Uh, also, Jesus is called Lord of the Sabbath. And also, Jesus is our Redeemer, or they would say Jesus redeems us. And so redeeming has the idea that we're a slave who needed to have our freedom paid for or, or we'll somehow in some kind of bondage and a payment would need to be made. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, 15 writers affirm that. Okay, Jesus bore our sins. Um, so, so Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross. Eight writers affirm that. Jesus forgives sins or forgives us or he remits sins or remits us. Um, that's kind of a central point about why, why did he come? Well, he came to be a nice guy. He came to show us truth. That wasn't the primary reason. Jesus came to die for our sins. We had 17 writers affirming that. Okay, now Jesus is a mediator between God and man. We had 11 writers affirming what Hebrews 9.15 says. Um, so a mediator is one who has two parties that might have uh, be hostile to each other, or one hostile to the, to the other, or something in between them, and he breaks down the barrier that they can come together. And that's what Jesus did for us. But where, where in the early church writings does it say that Muhammad also is a mediator between God and man? Do you uh, have they, a lot they, of the early they, church they, writers they, saying this? Well, on one hand, they don't say that. Uh, on the other hand, um, Muslims often you wouldn't use that term, though they, they might have a similar concept. Likewise, it says there's totally absent from the early church is any mention as Mary as a co-mediator or co-redeemer like the Catholic Church and for example the Catholic uh, Catechism teaches. Um, so, 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 so you, don't need no Mary, you don't need Mary as a mediator. Right. You don't need Muhammad as a mediator. No. Uh, you don't find this in any early church history. What you do need is Jesus right. they, as they, your mediator. They had no concept of any other mediators uh, besides Jesus. And that's just yeah. a that's a stone cold fact, right? And, and so you're saying, well, which it, which is the purpose of, of Jesus here? Well, all of these are are the purpose of Jesus. They're all complementary. They all play together. And denying these kind of things is like denying the central part of Christianity. And you'd be a person would be misleading people if they claim to be a Christian and yet didn't buy these things. And whatever group they're a part of, they're not a group that has anything to do. Uh, or, and, and is even antithetical to, to the early Christians. And it reminds me of the fact that when someone claims to be a Christian, and they, says they're, they, they say they're a Christian, but then they don't go with what the Christian uh, Bible teaches, what the Christian church has taught, uh, the essential doctrines, well, it doesn't matter if they say they're a Christian. They are not following Christian teachings and right. doctrines. Right. All right, so give some examples uh, for P.A. of Jesus bore our sins. A letter to Diognetus, written about 130 A.D., says that Jesus took the burden of our iniquities, in chapter 8, page 28. Uh, as for P.9, Jesus forgives or remits either sins or us. Uh, Justin Martyr, uh, 150 A.D., mentions that he would be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This is in the first apology of Justin Martyr, chapter 33, page 174. And as mentioned earlier, uh, some religions today would don't agree with that. Liberal Christians uh, would deny that, uh, some would deny that Jesus died for our sins. But liberal Christians are kind of like all over the map on a lot of different areas. So some would deny, some might affirm, some would say, well, you know, it's kind of up in the air. Uh, Mormon missionaries, uh, I've heard them uh, emphasize that Jesus sweating blood in the garden uh, was part of the atonement as well as him dying on the cross. And there's nothing in the Bible about that. Okay. Uh, the other thing about paying for our sins is that... Uh, Jesus, well, when you say there's yeah. nothing on, in, in the Bible about that, you're talking about, you said as well as dying on the cross. The Bible does oh, say about uh, dying uh, on the uh, cross. I'm sorry. It says about dying on the cross for our sins. It does say that he sweat blood you know, in, in, in the garden, but it doesn't say that the sweating of the blood 
had anything to right, do with Mor- it. Right, in Mormon yeah. theology, they make the, the sweat of the blood of Jesus as part of the atoning sacrifice, right. which is not the case according to the biblical record. Right. All right. right. Looking here, the, you know, these are some of the, I guess, the cent- central doctrines that you have to make a decision. The Bible presents these doctrines on one hand. The early church affirms all these doctrines. And you can believe what that says, or you cannot believe what it says. But you, you know, you know. And of course, it's a free country. You can do what you want, but don't say that you're the same religion as the early Christians if you can't accept these doctrines. Now, what I find interesting too, just looking at it from a theological, a biblical position, is that one reason a true Christian believes true Christian doctrine coming from the true Word of God, which is the Word of God, the Bible. Uh, is the fact that the Bible itself talks about how you must be born again. Jesus said you must be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5 talks about how we're renewed from the washing of the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We're regenerated. And when you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way by the power of God, suddenly you believe all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, the carnal mind is that enmity towards God. It hates God. And, and why? Because a natural man without the Spirit of God can, cannot understand the things of God, neither can he know them. And because of these problems, unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit within your life, where you're born again according to what the Scripture teaches, you're going to really hate the things of God, generally. <laughs> and it's going to be difficult for you to believe this stuff with faith and obedience to God. And this is Part of the problem here, it's a, it's a spiritual problem, and many of these people that simply refuse to accept what the Christian church and the early Christian church has taught, what the Word of God teaches, is they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit within their lives in a supernatural way where they can actually believe all these doctrines that Steve is going through. And I... I think that's very important to understand. One reason people deny these things is they simply don't have that power of God in their lives to actually accept these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's something a lot of people never take into account when we're talking about doctrines. Because most people think, oh, you can just believe whatever. But they forget that part of real Christianity, there's a supernatural aspect of the actual divine power of God in believing these doctrines. I mean, this is very central to how we even come to have faith in Christ is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, I can right. preach all day, but go, go back to what you're doing, bro. Okay. <laughs> right. So when we talk about the gospel of Christ and you say lots of true things about God, lots of true things about the Bible, if you don't affirm this part, then what you have really is not the gospel. And uh, at least it's not the gospel that the early church would recognize. So, I mean, people can make up their own religions. It's kind of funny, though, that some people um, are really uh, like to study the Gnostics and they think that they might be alternate forms of Christianity. But even the Gnostics, in a manner of speaking, uh, believe that, that Jesus somehow redeemed us. And so even, you know, if someone wants to say they believe in Gnosticism, you know, or that that may be an alternative, besides saying, do you really think Jesus, hate, you know, was against the God of the Old Testament? you really think that he... Uh, you know, it was against all, 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 of, all of the Jewish tradition and everything, you can also ask them, well, if you believe that there's any uh, possible credibility to the Gnostics, then do you believe that in some way Jesus redeemed us? And, and, and then if they don't affirm that, then it's like, well, then you're given a, a, a smokescreen, a straw man argument or, or an ad hominem argument that you don't believe yourself. Because even those guys believe that he redeemed us. Even the Ebionites, another cult back then, they even believe that Jesus died for us and, 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 and Jesus uh, somehow uh, by the cross did something for us. And so all of these uh, Orthodox Christians, all these cults, they united that, that Jesus did something fundamental for us besides teach us um, just uh, you know, nice teaching and, 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 and be a good example. And if you want to deny that, don't point to any of them that, uh, uh, for um, credibility. Just admit that it's something that you're, you know, they're being made it up because you'd rather believe it. Uh, one thing uh, I've, I've learned, though, from reading about the Gnostics is a lot of times you look at this and you say, how can anyone believe it's true? And maybe um, something being true isn't such a high priority for them as it was, as, as it is to say me. Maybe... 
uh, if something is thr thrilling, if something's interesting, if something supports what they want to do anyway, then maybe people want to believe that uh, more than what's true. And you, every person has to decide. If you found out something that was true about God that you kind of didn't want to believe or maybe didn't like, what would you do? Would you follow the truth first or would you follow your own pleasure of what you liked first? And I think it, a lot of it kind of boils down to that. If you want to follow the true God and follow what's true, you have to do that. Uh, and that might mean changing your lifestyle or changing uh, how you live or, or what you say or, or how you live. But a lot of that, I think, is just a compromise to say, let's mix something to make it more palatable uh, for what we want to do anyway. And that's what the early church wouldn't do. The early church would not compromise um, on, on, on that. And they were willing not only to teach this, but to die for what they believed in. Well, it all goes back, it goes back to uh, Genesis, basically, where you have uh, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel are going to give sacrifices to God. And uh, we all know the story. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God, and then Cain's sacrifice was not accepted by God. Now, if we go with what a lot of these people out here that attack Christianity and real Christians and, and the actual Christian faith as presented to us by the Word of God, they would say, well, that's not right for this God to accept Abel's and reject Cain's. Because after all, Cain was sincere. Mm -hmm. He was sincere in his sacrifice. And he went through a lot of trouble to do this for God. And God just rejected it. That's not right. That's not fair. But see, God demands from us uh, the kind of worship that he wants. Not what we want. <laughs> and, and people aren't going to do that. It goes back to what you want. They want to have a religion that's palatable, palatable to themselves not to God. But with that, we're about out of time for this program. This ends show number six in this continuing series on early church history. Please join us next time for show number seven in this series as we continue down this road studying what early church Christian history teaches us in relationship to what our Christian beliefs are today. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison. God bless you. Join us again next time. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 